Thank you very much, Joan. And I do want to thank the organizers of the conference. It's such a privilege to be here. Um, in spite of the fact Christina had to hunt me down, I'd gone off the grid in Saskatchewan. <laughs> and if you ever try to find a wireless Starbucks off the grid, it's quite something, but she did it. And I'm really grateful and, and very happy to be here and to see all of you. Okay. So Mary Schaefer, um, she's not well known in Canada, I don't think, but she was a painter, photographer, and writer from Philadelphia who is best known for her work in the Canadian Rockies in the early 20th century. To the best of my knowledge, she never produced a self-portrait or an autobiography, at least not in the classic art historical or literary senses of the terms. She never stood in front of herself, as it were, and painted or photographed or wrote about herself, all of which she was well equipped to do. With no self-portrait or even an autobiography to examine, then what are we to do when it comes to the question of self-representation? That is the theme of this conference. In this case, I propose we expand our view to see and consider less literal and more multidisciplinary means of representation. Because while Schaefer eschewed self-portraiture and autobiography, she certainly crafted a well-conceived and well-received public persona through her published photography, cartography, and travel writing. And this was a persona that was welcomed and embellished by reviewers' portrayals of her in their unanimously positive responses to her best-known work, Old Indian, Trail of the, Old Indian Trails of the Canadian Rockies. Uh, which was published in 1911 and reviewed in at least 29 newspapers across the United States and Canada. Typical is the commentary in the New York Times, quote, it is difficult to decide just what impresses us most. The excellence of the writing, the picturesqueness of the country described, or the personality of the author herself. The hundred photos taken by the author are remarkably fine, wrote the reviewer. You'll notice um, on the cover, if you, if you can see that, that um, credit for the photographs, however, is shared with uh, Mary W. Adams. Furthermore, photographs and texts of Schaefer's journeys in the Rocky Mountains of Canada in the early 20th century resonated with audiences in their day. Today, they engage scholars and readers from across a range of interests, from conservation and environmentalism to Aboriginal histories, women's writing and photography histories, and wilderness studies. Much of this work rests on a foundation of Schaefer biographies published in 1980 and 2001. And so the artist's identity, what it is and how it came to be, begs consideration for the profound impact it has had on how Schaefer's work and that of other women um, is assessed and understood. Margaret Atwood asks, can an author exist apart from the work and the name attached to it? In teasing apart the strands of Schaefer's identities, that is the persona she created as a public figure in the early 20th century, and the ones that have grown posthumously, I've come to realize three things about Schaefer's self-representation. One, it was a skillfully constructed melange of fact and invention, utilizing both text and imagery. Two, it was grounded on the shifting gender moors and politics of her day. And three, it has been tremendously successful in both aesthetic and historical terms. Her self-representation was not only fundamental to the popularity and resonance of her work when it was published, it has been profoundly distracting to later biographers and critics seeking an authentic, authorial eye. Most Schaefer studies, both popular and academic, have taken her writing, both published and not, to be biographically factual and her photography to be documentary in purpose and form. This has led to confusion and contradiction of historical facts in secondary sources, as well as to leaps of imagination and logic about Schaefer's life, character, and creative practices. Between 1904 and 1927, 
Schaefer published 16 articles about her travel and work in the Rocky Mountains of Canada and a trip to Japan in scientific society journals in the United States and the United Kingdom and in popular American and Canadian outdoors magazines. Most of these articles were illustrated with photographs she had made. She also published two substantial and richly illustrated books. The first from 1907 is a definitive scientific contribution, a botanical accounting of the alpine flora in the Canadian Rockies, for which she produced black and white photographs and uh, watercolor paintings. And you see that referenced on the title page to Old Indian Trails. And the second from 1911 is Old Indian Trails of the Canadian Rockies, as it's known which is her narrative of a quest over two seasons to find a legendary and uncharted lake that was carved deep in the Rocky Mountain wilderness, known to us today as Moline Lake in Jasper National Park. As you can also see then on the title page, the 100 photographs uh, that were made by Schaefer and her traveling companion on these trips, Mary Adams, or better known to us as Molly Adams. And she also produced a map so quite a bit going on here. Schaefer's preface told Indian Trails is titled Why and Wherefore, and it sets an intimate and personal tone for her readers. So I'll read you just a little excerpt from that. She wrote, when the cold breath of the mountain tops blew down upon us and warned us that the early winters were not far away, that the camping days were almost done for the year, when we reluctantly turned our backs upon the sweet mountain air, the campfire, the freedom, discarded the much-loved buckskins and hobnail shoes for the trappings dictated by the delineator. We emerged into the world, the better-known world, sure of the envy of all our listeners. Did they listen? No, scarce one. With all the pigments we might use, the numbers were few who enthused. Those who needed enthusing, they with aches and pains, with sorrows and troubles, listened the least or looked upon our mountain world as but a place of privation and petty annoyances. For them I have written the following pages." So from the preface we see that, that it not only sets the tone for the book, but it also subtly establishes Schaefer's central theme of gender and social roles from which her literary and historical personas have subsequently grown. Clothing, accommodation, and civilization ever popular concerns in women's travel literature at the turn of the 20th century, and I dare say now as well, foreshadow the tension between adventure and convention that underpins the subsequent narrative. Casting the journeys as a personal quest rather than professional expeditions that were as arduous and successful as those of the male geologists and surveyors around her, for the purpose of seeking peace rather than staking her claim to the uncharted lake also serves the literary rather than literal leaning of the narrative. The persona that Schaefer first created is a blend of fact and fiction fashioned by a combination of description and invention, visually constructed with photographs and maps and written with imagination and literary license. One of her traveling companions, Molly Adams, confirmed Schaefer's use of literary license. Recounting a trip to the Kootenai Plains made in 1906, she wrote, or Adams wrote in a private letter, I kept a brief diary of facts. Mrs. S. kept one of facts and fiction. Very amusing. She may publish part of it. And the question this raises is one Jill Lepore has asked when considering the value of narrative to history writing. That is, what happens when, quote, the boundary between history and fiction blurs, as in fact it does in Schaefer's writing and uh, photography. For Schaefer, what happened was creative and critical success at the time of publication. Of publication. In the case of Schaefer's studies, however, misunderstanding and misrepresentation has followed. Literary scholar Julie Rack, who has studied autobiography and memoir, has shown that, quote, the attempt to write oneself into a narrative results in the creation of oneself as other, lowercase other, a person who exists in a book as a character in order to turn one's life into a story for others' enjoyment, provocation, and education. Nevertheless, those studying Schaefer's work took at face value her claims that the stories she told were truthful 
and interpreted, interpreted this to mean they were factual. As a result, biographers, journalists, and playwrights have inflated the literary persona created by Schaefer, from that of a woman looking at a, uh, working at a liminal historical moment for white women in North America, to that of an historically extraordinary woman, someone who has subsequently been admired and even emulated by women literally following her tracks in the Rocky Mountains. Relying on such work, literary scholars have based their own conclusions on the 1980 heavily edited, what was called a reprint of her book. And that reprint excluded portions of the text as well as the original photographs. And then um, li literary scholars have also uh, worked with the life story that was created in 2001 uh, by Schaefer's uh, only biographer to date. They've done so in lieu of examining the original 1911 and 1912 editions. This, this came out in summer of 11, and in January 12, they reprinted it uh, with, a, with a new map included. By doing so, these scholars have reshaped the persona as a caricature of colonial contradictions and misbehavior. In both cases, popular and academic, there has been a failure to consider the socio-historical moment in a complex or even skeptical way, or to start from a point that sees Schaefer as an educated, experienced, ambition, ambitious, and informed woman, much like the women in this room today, rather than as a stereotyped, naive, pampered socialite and wealthy white woman." End quote. In the same vein, these writers have failed to recognize and seriously assess how Schaefer mobilized her aesthetic tools and skills as an artist and photographer and her narrative skills as a writer to create a both entertaining and disruptive idea of what women were seen to be and what they could be and do. They have read her work literally as factual rather than literarily as truthful and far more entertaining than plain facts conveyed. In 1979, in her study, Reinventing Womanhood, literary scholar Carolyn Halbrun observed a certain pattern of behavior in women. Quote, men have monopolized human experience, leaving women unable to imagine themselves as both ambitious and female. If I imagine myself, woman has always asked, whole, active, a self, will I not cease in some profound way to be a woman? In the introduction to Old Indian Trail, Schaefer portrays herself and Adams as struggling with this very issue. She wrote, there are few women who do not know their privileges and how to use them. Yet there are times when the horizon seems restricted and when we seem to have reached that horizon and the limit of all endurance. To sit with folded hands and listen calmly to the stories of the hills we so long to see the hills which had lured and beckoned us for years before this long list of men ever set foot in the country. Our cups splashed over and we looked into each other's eyes and said, why not? Well, why not indeed? Or as Howard Brown observed of women's experiences, the answer must be imagine and the old idea of womanhood be damned. Now, as inspiring as this sentiment may be for some, it is a mistake to take Schaefer's description literally. Rather, it should only be enjoyed and perhaps admired for its literary prowess that encapsulates much about the time and place in which, in which she was working. Schaefer was about a half a decade older than the youngest of the new woman cohort, born between 1865 and 1895. She was born in 1861. She was immersed and well-versed in the uh, debates and, um, and aspirations of the progressive era, but she never explicitly opined on women's rights in a polemical way. Instead, through her writing and photographs as well as her cartography, she created contrasts and encouraged readers to imagine. Take for example, I do have other pictures here. Um, Take this one for example, the visual reference uh, those of us are familiar with, and this is where Susan's work and mine cross paths, of course. Uh, this is a 1920 uh, portrait of Schaefer. It is attributed to George Noble of Calgary. The print is in the archives in Banff, the White Museum archives, and is inscribed on the back as a Christmas gift to Mary M. Vox, who was Schaefer's colleague in both Philadelphia and the Rockies. Vox was another well-known painter and photographer who in fact made Schaefer's portrait 
um, at about the time of her first marriage in 1889. Now, Schaefer's work uh, was included in the exhibition of the work of American women photographers that Frances Benjamin Johnson curated for the Paris Exposition in 1900. So you're not surprised to see yeah. this image yeah. again here. Now, while I am skeptical that the reference is deliberate, even uh, if not intended this way at the time, it really is impossible not to look at the Schaefer image and not think of, of the Johnston image. Um, but, you know, building a house, and she ended up moving lock, stock, and barrel from old Philadelphia to the Banff Museum. Oh, I've got to talk faster here. Um, to the frontier town of Banff in 1912 to live on her own was a relatively radical thing to have done in the eyes of Schaefer's peers. And so this, this composition may, in fact, have been a bit of a wink of acknowledgement to Vox back in Philadelphia. Schaefer herself appears in only four of the hundred photographs. Um, that appear in Old Indian Trails. One is the frontispiece on her beloved nibs. There's more about horses than people in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, the others include this one in which she's bent over a campfire tending a pot in a buckskin jacket and skirt. Notice, notice the jacket. This one uh, in the book is where she's uh, actually uh, cleaning some blankets. They tend to smell like horse after a while. And, uh, so that's three. And then this one. Uh, in the bottom left, you see Molly Adams and then Schaefer beside her and uh, their two guides that year. Now, this portrait is labeled one of our summer homes in the book, and uh, which, of course, implies that it was taken in 1907 or 1908 during the time in which these uh, uh, trips were being made. But in fact, it was made in 1906, a different trip to the Kootenai Plains. But it's implied that it is factual being in the book at this time. So it's just, it's just an example of the license that Schaefer took to tell her story. It's still truthful, it's just not factual. And it erases the question then of the effect of literary uh, bias, uh, which geologist and biologist uh, Stephen J. Gould has spoken about. By this he means communicating experience through storytelling rather than facts and data. And he talks about the web of tales that emerges um, to have an impact on knowledge and meaning, which is very interesting for scientists writing about their work. So again, while it wasn't factual, it certainly was truthful. Now, despite the uh, few published photographs of Schaefer, the archives contains numerous photographs of both Schaefer and Adams uh, riding horses, scrambling along uh, mountains, as we can see here, Schaefer in the front and Adams behind her. There's photographs of them setting up, reading, writing, and resting in camp, and uh, otherwise engaged in the day-to-day the, uh, -day activities of their journeys. In all of these, they are dressed for physical activity in wilderness, usually in trousers, buckskin jackets and gloves, and bandanas, occasionally with bug nets protecting their heads and always in sturdy hobnail boots. Many of these images are hand-tinted glass slides, so anything you're seeing in color here is one of those. And as such, uh, while not published, these slides were likely projected during public lantern slide lectures that Schaefer presented annually during winters um, spent in her Pennsylvania hometowns of Westchester and Philadelphia. The best known among these today is one that Schaefer uh, tinted and labeled She Who uh, Colored Slides. This was made by Molly Adams during the 1907 excursion. Schaefer, you can see, is facing away from the camera in a profile that hides most of her face and instead privileges the back and side of the jacket as the center of focus rather than the person wearing it. The viewer's eye rests mainly on the jacket, but also follows the direction of the gaze into the tent, pitched among the trees. So you see the jacket solidly in its wilderness context. It's a very fine garment that she's displaying for the camera and for her future audience back in the East. It's also a working coat. She's seen in photographs wearing it. Work, well, you saw it working over the campfire, for example, or when she was hiking in the mountains with uh, Behind her is the guide, William Warren, but she's got it tied around her waist there. So it's a hard-working coat. 
When the title supplied, however, as it quite literally is on the slide, it suggests the image is not so much about the coat as the role of photography, painting, and travel in shaping Schaefer's emerging ant identity for herself. Now, um, there's the image. You see on the right is an image of Molly Adams. And uh, these are, I think, of tremendous interest today because they, they do show how Schaefer chose to portray herself in wilderness. And then, so Adams made the photograph of Schaefer. Schaefer made this photograph of, of uh, Adams, which uh, was not published during their lifetimes. Now, even Rudyard Kipling bought into the portrayal that Schaefer creates through these images. And the description of their encounter in Newfield, BC, I'm running over about just a minute. Uh, in contrast to the everyday mountain wear and the clothing she and her audiences would have been wearing in Philadelphia at the time of presenting these glass, uh, glass uh, lantern slide lectures, they're seeing her dressed where she was and, and then dressed with her audiences. It really does deliberately set up this tension and contradiction in her work. So, in conclusion, Carol Smith Rosenberg cautions that an analytical framework is essential to writing histories that take women's own work and words as their most significant primary sources. And it's here that lies the challenge and opportunity to reconsider women's practices and uh, certainly the practice and impact of Schaefer's work. Taking up the challenge of rethinking the documentary view and use of Schaefer's texts and photographs whether private or public, published or unpublished. My work approaches her text as crafted narrative and her photography is fluid, complex, and creative. The persona of Mary Schaefer, I hope, is not sought in my work, although one does emerge. What is sought is a more complex understanding of Schaefer's work in its time and place and the significance of both her work and its interest to others. Thank you.